بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا من سيئات أعمالنا من يحده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الحدي حدي محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي After praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sending immense salutations of peace and greetings upon the final Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and removing the sickness or asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remove the sickness within ourselves and the diseases within us and around us and it's quite sad that as Muslims we need to begin to discuss such topics which possibly are of interest for some individuals but unfortunately has possibly become a disease in the Muslim Ummah that many individuals as we will touch upon begin to see this concept as something trivial something minute even after many many texts have proven abstinence from such an action many many a hadith the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and even that which is classified as tajriba common practice of what takes place in society proves that this is an action that we should stay away from and we know that the evidences which come inside the Quran or the manhajul Quran the methodology of the Quran is to develop and nurture the iman of the human being because for many of us it's become rhetoric and academia in our lives the Quran is a book of change. It changes the individual. Yukhrujuhum min al-bulumati ila nur brings you out of the realms of darknesses to the one light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what the book does. It changes, reforms individuals. And that's when the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveal inside various stages that you find for those of you who are familiar with the ayat which talk about making khamar haram you find four stages in the ulama of ulum al-quran that you find the four stages of the various ayat that you find in general some go to opinion three but four is more approved because the first ayah which mentions it talking about inside surah al nahl talking about the drink there is some benefit in the drink from the bee and in that is signs for men of understanding. So ulama here highlight this is something isharat and khafi, a hidden sign that there is going to be something which is going to develop stem from this initial halal substance that you find. And then you find the ayat inside Surah Al-Baqarah, yasa'aluna ka'anil khamri wal maysir. Then you find the ayah inside Surah Al-Nisa about don't come to prayer. Wala taqrabu salata wa antum sukara. And then finally you find total prohibition inside the verses inside Surah Al-Ma'idah verse number 1991 Until the ayah it continues. Now here you find that when this final ayah was revealed you find according to Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha that you find that the methodology, the iman of the human beings was developed to such a stage that when this ayah came down, everyone gave up drinking. Even those individuals who had it on the tips of their mouths, they just quickly threw it away and streets of Medina were flying in wine. And I'm sure that all of us are familiar with this. So they reached that level of Iman. Now you may be thinking, what is the parallel with that in relation to today? Many of us know the dangers of many things. But the only suggestion that comes to my mind, and it could be harsh, is there's a sickness, as I began with. 
fi qulubihim maradun fa zadahumullahu marada that some islamic individuals some people some individuals their perception unfortunately seems to be an evil perception inna alladhina yuhibbuna an tashi'a al-fahishata fi alladhina amanu some people want to spread fahish fawahish illicit conduct and behavior inside society amongst the believers and obviously we know what to expect from non-muslims we know what to expect from them but a sad factor is that more and more way we are seeing this from amongst muslims who are beginning to question the authenticity of islam its role in the western hemisphere its role in the 21st century and what we fail to understand that if you study what is classified as maqasid al-shari'a the purpose of the islamic law you find from whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes halal or haram there's great benefit in that five general principles that you find the maqasid al-shari'a the purpose of islamic law or the divine governance is to preserve the person's deen their faith to preserve their aql their mind to preserve their nafs their soul to preserve al-ird their honor their dignity and to preserve their mal their wealth anything you study in Greek in detail you find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he makes it halal subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it haram that is what you'll find it will encompass whether that's addressing Muslims non-Muslims the whole of humanity there are those fawaid those benefits that you find there to preserve the human being so if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has touched upon certain concepts then we are actually challenging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's what we're actually doing as we'll come and we'll see in the discussion be then later and that's what we're trying to do we're trying to challenge the laws of God and we know that Islam has this concept of closing the doors of sin or vice Islam isn't other religions even though Islam is not a religion it's a way of life but Islam nips the problem right from the root right from the beginning nip it nips it from the bud as they say before it begins to stem and it flowers and it becomes a great big flower and then people turn and said well what is the solution now so islam has those principles of stopping actions right from the beginning even mundane actions that we do on a daily basis if the end of that mundane action becomes something dangerous then that those simple steps become haram for example if a person travels for education walking upon their legs taking any form of transport going to seek an education going to seek their sustenance that's perfectly acceptable now another individual makes the same journey but goes to a location whereby the person may indulge in haram in sin or vice that individual's journey now becomes haram whatever form of transport they take is irrelevant the end purpose of the journey is something which is haram which is forbidden so Islam will clamp down right on the beginning of the journey that this person is not allowed to take that journey and these principles are laid down inside works of Asul al-Fiqh talking about yani, Saddu al-Dhari'ah closing the door towards sins or Daf al-Mafsada preventing yani, evil to spread and that's what many Muslims have forgotten to prevent evil is far, far more important than the spreading of good bear that in mind because good is something that people will come towards but evil people will rush towards evil so if you clamp down on something which is haram then automatically people will turn to the halal but we're, we're living the opposite we encourage we don't mind that if haram takes place and thus you find that the deen becomes a deen of prevention that's what Islam is it prevents you right from the beginning prevention of the human being is what we find and as I mentioned does not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala know the essence of the human being does not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala know what he has created he is the most subtle the most aware so as I mentioned we're trying to challenge Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has laid down that this is the nature of the human being this is the essence of the human being and this is what could happen to the human being so we want to highlight what is the beginning of this sin and what is the end 
the beginning is the glance and the end is a rajam or al jald is either to be whipped or to be stoned so the beginning as we said may some people may see it as something trivial so the beginning is just a glance a nadra and then the end is a rajam of the person and he is married and the person is not married then is al jald to be flogged a hundred lashes and then you find taqribu am and the rest of the rulings that apply so right from the beginning what is the nature of the human being the quran talks about zuyyina lin nasi hubbu al shahawati min al nisa wal banin man has a covetous love for women in surah ali imran in the beginning is what you find zuyyina lin nasi hubbu al shahawati min al nisa wal banin and then children and then the piling and the collecting of wealth and property and land and branded horses all of that is the provisions of this dunya so that's teaching human being something that this is a natural way of a human being likewise the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam hubba ilayya min ad-dunya at-tayyib wa an-nisa wa ju'alat qurratu ayni fi as-salah the most beloved things of this dunya upon me is the tayyib sweet smelling good smelling fragrance women and the coolness and the tenderness has been placed of of my eyes has been placed inside yani the salah that's what the prophet muhammad sallam enjoyed that was a prophet of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that's something to ponder and to think about so when a human being says well you know sheikh you know it's not really in, in my heart i don't really have that well, you might be 1.01% of the rest of the manhood or you may have some serious problems within yourself and you can leave that to take that whichever way you want so islam channels this feeling to a matrimonial relationship is what the quran begins to highlight seeing the nature of the human being thus it begins to channel the human being in that correct form of expressing oneself and thus you find in the following surah and the beginning surah an-nisa you find fankihu ma taba lakum min an-nisa mathna wa thulatha wa ruba' marry from whoever you want from amongst the women 2 3 or 4 فَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ أَلَّا تَعْدِلُوا فَوَاحِدَةً If you fear that you will not be just and marry only one woman أَوْ مَا مَلَكَتْ أَيْمَانُكُمْ ذَلِكَ أَدْنَا أَلَّا تَعُولُوا And that's an ishara, you find it's better to only marry the one so that you don't become unjust. So here you find the Qur'an is giving the tarqib. After highlighting previously that this is the nature of the human being and this is the way to channel that gharisa that you find, that inclination of the human being that you find is to channel yourself into any nikah. into the state of wedlock or marriage and likewise you find that the human being is following the characteristics of the believers because many of us have forgotten that chastity and modesty is not just the way of a woman modesty is also the way of a man a man is also modest in the way that he approaches himself obviously there is no modesty in the seeking of knowledge and seeking one's right but in all other aspects the rulings in general are the same and so thus you find that the way of the believers you study surah al-mu'minun once again highlighting what is the way of the believers qad aflah al-mu'minun successful are those believers in the 23rd chapter of the quran you find these eight characteristics which are mentioned about them which all help the individual increase one's iman until it comes ila qawli allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wal ladina hum li furujihim hafidun those individuals who preserve their chastity preserve their private parts illa ala azwajihim aw ma malakat aymanuhum except for whatever their right hand possesses or what they own fa innahum ghayru malumin there's no blame upon them fa man ibtagha wara'a dhalika fa ulaika hum al adun whoever seeks any other means those individuals are al adun wal adun bi ma'na yani al dhalimun the oppressors So that's the only way that one channels their khariza, their lust and their desires is through wedlock. You go out of that fold, then you become al-adun, the transgressors. That's how the Quran highlights it. And that's how the individual, the society needs to begin to understand 
this is the only natural form that you find for the human being to follow that way of life. And going beyond the bounds, as the ulama have talked about, كل شيء تجاوز حده أصبح ضده. Every time you go beyond the bounds, it ends up becoming the opposite. So excessive eating creates gluttony, obesity, becomes a sickness. Excessive sleep creates kasal, more laziness. So anything that even is halal, if you go beyond the bounds, it becomes the opposite. It becomes detrimental to the individual. So we need to find the balance. Because min ma'ani ahl sunnah is to be in the middle. Not to go to one extreme or go to the other extreme. وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا We made you the just and the middle nation. So, what is the beginning? As we touched upon was the glance. What does Islam say about anadhratu, the glance? Looking at somebody from the opposite yani, individual. So many individuals will jump quickly upon the ayat which talk about telling the woman to lower her gaze. But quite strange it is, because obviously many of us, we don't study the Qur'an in great detail. Because the Qur'an is a great big vast ocean. The more you delve into the ocean, the more treasures you begin to extract. The more hidden isharat that you find inside the Qur'an, the more that you live with the Qur'an. And that's the Qur'an begins and talks about, قُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ يَغُدُّ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِمْ Say to the believing men to lower their gaze. That's what you find firstly. That the believing men should lower their gaze. وَيَحْفَظُوا فُرُوجَهُمْ ذَلِكَ أَزْكَى لَهُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ خَبِيرٌ بِمَا يَصْنَعُونَ That is something, they should preserve their private parts. ذَلِكَ أَزْكَى لَهُمْ That is something which is pure and chaste for them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is fully aware بِمَا يَصْنَعُونَ Of what you do. Or the actions you carry out. So here once again, the look at the language of the Qur'an is teaching that the man should be the first one to lower his gaze. And then you find that the ayat, then, then they begin to address the women. وَقُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنَاتِ يَخْضُدْنَ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِنْ Say to the believing women that they should lower their gaze. وَيَحْفَدْنَ فُرُوجَهُنْ And they should preserve their private parts. وَلَا يُبْدِينَ زِينَتَهُنَّ إِلَّا مَا ظَهَرَ مِنْهَا And they should not expose their beauty except for that which naturally begins to appear whilst walking, exchanging something, etc. Which is yani, permissible. وَلْيَضْرِبْنَ بِخُمُرِهِنَّ عَلَى جُيُوبِهِنَّ And let them take their outer garments over their bodies and cover yani, their, their selves. And you can study the deeper meaning of عَلَى جُيُوبِهِنَّ etc. So this becomes the way of the believing woman. The believing woman is such. Because the believing woman finds that her example that she follows after the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is none other than the wives of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, or his intimate family members. The family of the Prophet, the female members of the Prophet Muhammad Ummahatul Mu'mineen, the mothers of the believers. So either you will take your parallel, your example from these women who are out on the streets, they will become your role models, or on the musalsalat, on the dramas, on the series, the actors, and we know that many ulama in the fatah highlighted that if women imitate women in their hairstyles, in their dress, of women who are known to be immoral women, it's forbidden for a good woman to do that. And unfortunately, many women don't pay heed to that. That they will imitate certain cultures and certain practices and say, well, it's all underneath the veil. But whatever is underneath the veil is imitating the common trend of women who are known that this is an action, an imitation of women who are immoral, then that is not permissible. And also one needs to bear in mind the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi whoever imitates him becomes like them. As Ibn Taymiyyah rahmatullahi highlights as well that you're imitating someone brings you closer and closer to that individual paraphrasing his words. So if you love the people, the salihin, the salihat, you want to be like them in everything that they do. And I know how some people want to twist the following verse and say that this refers to the, the wives of the Prophet Muhammad 
as you find inside Surah Al-Ahzab, the 33rd chapter of the Quran, verse number 59. Ya ayuhal nabi yukulli azwajika wa banatika. Say to your spouses and say to your daughters, wa nisa il mu'mineen. But then comes and say to the, the women of the believers. So if you claim to be mu'mina, O mu'minat, the believing women, then the address is towards you, yudhnina alayhinna min jalabibihin. Then you should take that commandment on board. Take your jilbab, take your outer garment upon your bodies. Because at the moment you can see the common trend of what people are wearing. Well, at least I'm wearing a hijab with a Valentino sign, with an Amani sign. That's not hijab. That's a hijab or label with fake Valentino V just put on the hijab. And what is the history of people like Valentino and Armani and such individuals? It's exposure. And the real essence of many of them, that even many of the young brothers wear their labels and wear their tight trousers, is they have homosexual connotations. Because even brothers as well at the moment, wearing tight trousers, read what the ulama have written about wearing tight trousers. Read what medics have said about wearing of tight trousers. Al-Qawl al-Mubin fi akhtai al-Musallin. Read this 300 page book plus talking about the akhtai, the mistakes of people who pray when they go down into sujood. What an awful sight do you see. Breaks your prayer. But we've got the rest all in place. We've got the bed with everything there. But then on top of that, we're dressing like this. What do you want to show in society? Who are you? For a man and a woman is to wear libas, which is fadfad, which is loose, baggy. That's the way. Irrespective of what else, whatever you're wearing, that's, that's not a big issue for Ahl Sunnah. But what we find is a misunderstanding. So we're not going to one extreme saying that you have to wear the tawbas if you're in Saudi Arabia, or you have to wear the salwar, salwar kameez if you're in Afghanistan. Finding the middle, as long as whatever you wear conforms with the sunnah, is the right dress, is loose, that's acceptable for the human being to do that. But when you come to the prayer, then try to wear a long shirt or long garment as you find the fatah of the ulama when you offer the prayer, lest something is shown from your body, etc. And that was the way of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So if our example is supposed to be those individuals, then they must be either we're ignorant, and we can excuse you for your ignorance, or as I began with, there's a sickness. That's the only two things a person can come. And so hopefully, inshallah, our intention today is to remove that ignorance. And if you have that sickness, then all we can do is pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He removes that sickness from your heart and from our hearts as well. That's what we can do. Because we all have sicknesses inside our heart. But at least we know one thing, alhamdulillah, and we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that. That our sicknesses, we keep them within ourselves. We don't preach them to society. We don't encourage individuals. Whatever weaknesses we have, we keep them within ourselves. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to cover up the weaknesses that we have and the deficiencies that we have to cover them in this dunya and the akhirah as well. So our aim is never to tarnish any individuals or to make people feel wrong about themselves. Our task is to advise individuals and to highlight from the evidences what is the correct way of the believers bi idnillahi ta'ala. So basically, what the eye does not see, the heart does not desire. So the eye does not perceive, the heart does not have that desire. And likewise you find that in the Quran it talks about that you wear the hijab, Allah yu'dhain, that you're not harmed, you're not pestered. You're known as a good, righteous individual. At the moment it's a mixed messages we're being given. Very wrong understanding of Islam is being given to the wider society. That I wear hijab at the same time, I'm standing in public and I'm smoking. Or I've grown my beard and I'm swearing on the streets. Or I'm being rude to the disbelievers. Or I'm just being a nuisance. Because it's a long journey of tarbiyah. A long, long journey. Because obviously living and surrounded by jahiliya, we find that many of us get so engrossed with ignorant practices, it takes a long while to just purify that to take that out of our hearts and to return back to that Puritan belief. So the glances you find in some narrations, the authenticity is questionable, but we'll mention 
how some individuals have used them as a form of evidence. Another to Saham min Siham Iblis, that the, the glance is from amongst the arrows of the devil. Amongst the devil's deception that you find is that, that, that initial glance that you find. Like I mentioned, there's discussion about the authenticity of the hadith, and we've only mentioned them just to highlight the point that the meaning does fall true based upon the other narrations, inshallah, that we'll mention and other aspects or evidences that, that you find. Ya yalladina amanu la tattabi'u khutuwat shaytan Oh, you believe, don't follow the footsteps of the devil. Wa man yattabi'u khutuwat shaytani fa innahu ya'muru bil fahshai wal munkar Whoever follows the footsteps of the devil, indeed the devil only orders individuals with fahsha and munkar and evil. al fahshab you've studied the meaning of it, entails every form of illicit behavior, immoral activity, immoral behavior. That's the way of shaitan. And obviously the beginning of immoral behavior begins with that perception of looking. And that's you find in the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, You have the first glance taken by, by startled, taken by surprise. But you don't have the second glance. So you may be thinking, then, how could the Prophet Muhammad use such terminology? There's supposed to be a jeel which is purified. From a, a mass amount of companions, they were young men. Have you ever come across the hadith, if I'm not mistaken, referring to Abdullah ibn Abbas or one of the other companions, whereby riding beside the Prophet Muhammad, his vision, his glance falls upon a woman, and the woman's glance falls upon him. And what does he do, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Did he say to him, you know, you're supposed to be a companion. You're supposed to be like the angels. Khairul Qarni. The best generation is my generation. Thumma alladheena yalunahum, thumma alladheena yalunahum. You're supposed to be the best ideal individuals. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with you. How you behave in this manner? The Prophet Muhammad s.a.w. just turned his face away. Turn the boy's face, young companion's face to the side. Because that's the nature of the human being. And there were companions around the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu A young man comes and asks the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu give me permission to commit zina. Boy, if he came to us today, you know what would happen. <laughs> Everybody here would just start beating the individual. But look at the wisdom of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu Do you have a mother? Do you have a khala? Do you have a sister? And that's our human beings, paraphrasing the hadith. Human beings are like that as well. They don't want you to do that action with their family members. How do you enjoy it to do it upon other family members? The Prophet placed his hand in his chest and prayed for him. That man, that young boy, never ever looked at another woman in his life. He became the most chaste of individuals. So we have to be practical and, and understand the society that we live in and the evil that we're surrounded in and how to nurture the youth to give them that tarbiyah to develop that faith of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَذَكِّرْهُمْ بِأَيَّامِ اللَّهِ Remind them about their return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Facing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And likewise the ahadith which talk about the young individual The seven under the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Is a young boy That a beautiful woman of lineage and prestige calls him But he says إِنِّي أَخَافُ Allah I fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turns away And likewise the opposite can fall true for the woman as well To stay away from vice That individual will be under the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And likewise you find in some hadith that you find that the person who lowers his gaze finds this halawatul iman, the sweetness of iman inside their heart. And only the mu'min can have that. So if you gain that sweetness of iman when you lower your gaze, then you've gained a concept of halawatul iman. And that's what we need to develop within our lives. That whatever you do is for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and brings you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even what you see around you may startle you. But the Quran gives that message as well. Say the good and the evil cannot be the same. Even though the evil may startle you. Sometimes it does look alluring. It does look shiny. But remember the proverb, all that glitters is not gold. Everything that glitters in front of you is not gold. So they may have the exterior, but many of these individuals are wretched as we'll touch upon. Wretched in their conduct and the way, the perception that they have of life. Then you find 
that leading on from this concept of the nadra, the glance, is what causes the individual to make that glance. So understand the khalfi, understand the background that how does an individual begin to make the glance. Now that glance comes about what is classified as tabarruj. Tabarruj is the way of jahiliya. Do not come out in a state of tabarruj as you find inside Surah Al-Ahzab in the days of pre-Islamic <coughs> ignorance. That a woman would come out in all of her zina, in all of her beauty, all of her attire, and thus that attraction will attract the sight of human beings. And before that, as I mentioned, if the affair was something basit, something very small, then why would the Prophet Muhammad Sallam turn his own beloved companion's face away from looking and glancing at a strange woman? If a woman comes out on the streets, not addressed appropriately, not wearing the attire, in general you find it's the shraf of her shaitan, that shaitan and he beautifies her. That's what shaitan does. If I'm not mistaken, in the collection of Ibn Hibban. And how about women coming out in a state of perfume? What do we find? That that woman is an immoral woman. And everybody who smells her, because of the way that the woman has come out. So women should be careful the way that they conduct themselves. And quite strange is you find prophetic statements of the Prophet Muhammad Al-Ariyat, Al-Kasiyat Dressed but yet naked What does that mean? Dressed but yet naked The current design and fashion trends Is what it's highlighting too That people will be clothed but at the same time Their bodily parts will still be revealing Is a prophecy of the Prophet Muhammad And so you find that this concept People may be saying that why are we transgressing on this point? Because you find in the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, I have not left any fitna which is more harmful upon men except for women. Another hadith, hadith you find: فَاتَّقُوا الدُّنْيَا وَاتَّقُوا النِّسَاءَ فَإِنَّ أَوَّلَ أَوَّلَ فِتْنَةِ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ كَانَتْ فِي النِّسَاءِ Fear the world and fear women, because indeed the first fitna that hit Bani Israel was regarding women. It's as if they read our texts, that the whole industry revolves around that. The whole world just revolves around that, is what they're trying to create inside this society. And thus we know that our women are sacred, linguistically. Our mothers, our daughters, our sisters, our wife, etc. We have that sense of honor. Because the Quran mentions, have you not seen the one who's been nurtured and brought up in a state of being a, a gem, a precious stone, a pearl? That's what they've been classified as being. That's why you find that the woman has a love towards jewelry and diamonds and pearls, and dressing up, etc. that you find. But that needs to be kept within its arena. It's not to be brought out in public because then that as we began with creates vice in society and that's what Islam tries to prevent and obviously we know that a righteous woman is the best commodity of this world and an immoral woman is what they say, state themselves obviously this, this isn't what Islam states but they state that the woman is a devil and that's what they, they talk about. And that's they try to even play upon the ayat inside the Bible to prove their point that Hawa was the initial one who led Adam to eat from the tree and from that she became the individual who has to go through all those hardships in life because of her initial sin. Even the Quran goes to the opposite that both of them disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while the one verse highlights inside Surah Taha that Adam was the one who disobeyed his Lord Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he is the one who should be in focus and the one in control. The second step that we find after the glance is al-kalam, is speech. So after the initial glance that you find, and you can study this in the, the famous Arab poet who wrote this about as well, 
first the glance, then the speech, then the dahik, thumma la'il, thumma kala, and all until the end of whatever takes place. So Islam lays down etiquettes about how to talk, how to speak, which unfortunately many of us have forgotten because it's become a common relaxation, a common norm of the land, of the people, of Muslims that there's no harm in being flamboyant. There's no harm in walking in a crowd of brothers and just shouting out and just laughing and joking. There's no harm for a brother to likewise to walk through the brothers, through the sisters and start shouting and joking. What does the Quran say about this? About the way that we speak? O wives of the Prophet Muhammad you are not like the rest of women if you fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As we mentioned that they are our qudwa, our example. فَلَا تَخْضَعْنَ بِالْقَوْلِ Don't be deceiving in your speech. Don't be deceptive inside your speech. Don't allure your speech. If you speak, speak rough and harsh. That's how the advice has been given to the wives of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu Lest that the individual has a disease or a sickness inside their heart, may be tempted by that, and say words which are correct and straightforward. So even the is speech, that's the way it should be. Rough and harsh, straight to the point. How many times have we heard that? Well, I didn't really mean it in that way. Maybe you understood it in that way. Well, I didn't really make that statement in that way. But remember, shaitan is ready to grasp those words and play them around. فَلَا تَخْضَعْنَ بِالْقَوْلِ Don't be deceptive in your speech. Don't be alluring in your speech. Don't beautify your speech. Except for to those individuals you're allowed to make that type of speech. But yet we find a common norm in our society. That even when the mashaykh come, sisters running after them, calling them out, behaving like this, is that the way? Where's your sense of haya gone? Where's your sense of modesty gone? Well, are the men of the ummah, are they dead? That's what I highlight. Are they dead? Is your brother dead? Is your husband dead? Is your father dead? Is there no one at home who can put forward your request? That's what this society is trying to create within us. That we should be flamboyant enough to do whatever we want to do. There's no rules and regulations. Who taught you that Islam? Who taught you that Islam? Real Islam is authentic Islam. Take it or leave it, full stop. There's no in-between. Don't take Islam as a joke, as a game. Because we won't tolerate it when people take it as a game. As I began with, it's quite simply a sickness. And some people, I know they don't like it. I know people say that I'm harsh, I'm rude. Yeah, I'm damn right hard and rude, or rude. Because that's what I learned from the book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Because the rules of the Quran are generic. We're not the Prophet Muhammad So those rules that are specific towards him, and even the Prophet Muhammad never touched no strange woman's hand, Never let no strange women come and rub his feet and rub his thighs and his legs or shake hands with strange women even he took the bait of the covenant from them. No strange woman ever touched his blessed hand So what Islam are you following today? It's something to begin to think about. Yes, there will be at times we will fall short out of our weakness of Iman but as I mentioned, we're not going to promote that. That's what people are trying to promote. That you can touch a woman's hand, it depends on your intention. It's all about your intention. So tomorrow you could do haram, it's all about your intention. But, but my intention wasn't that, was it, Sheikh? It was something else my intention was. I just fell into that. So it's quite clear what Islam teaches us, we should stick to that. Out of weakness, we may do that. That's a different ball game. Out of weakness. Don't try to make ta'wil of the ayat, of the ahadith, and say, well, these ahadith all nurture upon the intention of the human being. If it was all based upon the intention, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have told us that keep your hijab inside your heart. Keep your beard inside your heart. Keep your prayers inside your heart. Keep your fasting inside your stomach. Keep everything within you. But why does it come out? Because that's the meaning of Iman in the Ahl-Sunnah. It's the 
conviction inside your heart, is a testification of your tongue, and the amal bil jawarih, and the actions of the limbs, which testify to your iman. And iman, yazidu bil ta'a wa yanqus bil ma'asiyah, simple. You don't need to go into any other academic study. You take that home, as I always state, you become a successful believer, inshallah. Iman will increase via obedience, and decrease via disobedience, simple, full stop. That's what Ahlul Sunnah is. If you can develop that in your life, there it is. And so you find that these lustful words, alluring speech that you find is something, a dangerous concept that you find. Then comes a third stage. Al-Ikhtilat or Al-Khalwa. Free mixing or being alone. Intimate conversation leads to intimacy and being alone. All these chat rooms, palaver that you find. I'm looking for a spouse, I'm just talking. I'm doing this, I'm doing that. What is it? It's all common forms of what? Khalwa. That's what it is. Because there's no one there between you, just a screen and a keyboard. Obviously Allah subhanahu wa is watching over the individual. So it becomes a fo common form of khalwa, being alone. With someone that you should not be alone with. Unless there's a form of khitab, a proposal, or something that's taking place. Where maybe there may be some leeway. But other than that, there needs to be none. No intimate conversations on a one-to-one -one basis. As you find that if an individual is all on their own with a woman who's not a mahram, and the Muslims of Imam Ahmad, فَإِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ ثَالِثُهُمَا The third one is the devil. So a man and woman all on their own, the third individual is the shaitan. Something to be careful of. To put yourself inside that type of situation, إِيَّاكُمْ وَالدُّخُولَ عَلَى النِّسَاءِ Upon you is to be wary of coming into an arena of women or being alone with a woman. إِيَّاكُمْ Why such harsh words? Be aware. Be on your guard. Why do you find in our culture certain hadith become strange for us to accept? That the alhamu is moat, that the brother-in-law, the sister-in-law is deaf. But in our culture, it's mafi hadith, no problem. That's like my brother, that's like my sister. But why does Islam lay that down? Because that's where you find that corruption has begun and taken place on many occasions. From members inside the household mixing whereby they should not be mixing. And creating this vice within their homes and the wider society. And also you find it creates suspicion. If a man stands with a strange woman, it creates suspicion. Well, you might think, well, hang on, how does it create suspicion? It created suspicion at the door of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, When he is with his wife, Safiya radiallahu ta'ala anha, and two of the companions, they saw the Prophet Muhammad was standing there with a woman, and they quickly walked away, rushing. So he stopped them and gave them that advice or reassurance that indeed this is my wife Safiya in case you think, well we don't think anything bad of you Ya Rasulullah Sallallahu But indeed shaitan flows through the veins of human beings just like blood flows through your veins. Why? Don't take it something trivial because homes have been destroyed. That I saw you standing next to a strange man or standing stand next to a strange woman. So a person shouldn't come into that arena whereby rumor could spread about the individual. Because the most important aspect of a man is, and a woman is their chastity and their honor. You lose your honor and your dignity, there's no respect for you. There's no respect for you. So every individual should preserve and guard, as we mentioned right in the beginning, guard their honor, guard their chastity. Shouldn't tolerate that the people say that the person is... is Excuse the expression, a person is loose in their speech, loose in their conduct, loose in their behavior. No, that person should be, as we mentioned, preserving their, guarding their chastity, guarding their honor, guarding their conduct and the behavior of the individual. And then comes the fourth concept. After the glance, after the speech, after being intimate, you find relationship. Many people, they highlight, well, Sheikh, give, it, give it to me from the Quran about girlfriends and boyfriends. Give it to me from the Qur'an. I'll give it to you from the Qur'an. Go and look at Surah Al-Ma'idah, the fifth chapter, verse number five. وَلَا مُتَّخِذِي أَخْدَان You find individuals who don't take girlfriends. Go and read the translation, the rough rendition. That's the general loose translation of what the Quran is highlighting. What do you find at the moment? Common practice. 
trying to teach that this is a norm of life. That even being Islamic, what do you find? I'm finding my own partner, Sheikh. I found my own partner. Islamic and you're finding your own partner at the same time. So what's been happening in that journey of finding your partner? The glance, the speech, intimacy, conversation. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbid anything else could have been happening. How do we know? A real man, the meaning min ma'ani al rujula is a man is means to control himself. And that's what do you find? They try to highlight and Muslims begin to highlight. أَخْرِجُوا آلَ لُوتِ مِنْ قَرْيَتِكُمْ إِنَّهُمْ نَاسٌ يَتُطَهَّرُونَ Take out the people of Lut from the city. They want to be a purified people. They, yeah, that's what a Muslim is, purified. Chaste individual. Chastity. That's what a good Muslim is, good individual is. That's what the Quran talks about. Good men are for good women. Good women are for good men. Bad men are for bad women. كَمَا تَدِينُ تُدَانُ the way you conduct yourself in your life is the way you'll meet your partner. You find your partners in the streets, then you live your life on the streets. That's what will happen. There'll be no barakah, there'll be no blessing. And all these new concepts of, I'm a woman in my own right, and these new marriage contracts that you're, fi uh, you're finding at the moment. Ma anzal Allahu biha min sultan. No evidence on the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We admit there's mistakes in our society. We admit there's oppression, we admit there's wrong things that fathers are doing, brothers are doing, uncles are doing, imams are doing. Solution isn't to throw away the sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say, right, give the woman the free right to do whatever she wants to do. That's not the solution. That doesn't make sense. The solution is to go back and to rectify those problems and to keep it in line with the sharia. And the solution is not to throw away the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say women can do whatever they want to do. And I know that in the fiqh of Ahnaf, if I'm not mistaken, they highlight that. That there can be a nikah without a wali. That's a ruling that they follow. But even whilst I was in Pakistan, you find many of the ulama of Ahnaf, they took away that ruling because the end result was nothing but facade. The end result was that women were marrying their own selves. So they had to recognize that being ulama because that's what it means. إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاءِ Look at the, the crux of what could happen possibly in the future by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you can see that if this is enforced, what will happen in the future? That you can do whatever you want to do. Let's not get involved in who's endorsing it, who's getting involved in what the names, what the slogans are. Look at the wider picture of what is going to be created inside this society. And thus you find... Even in Islam at the moment, I find it very, very strange. Very strange. Yeah, Sheikh, what's wrong with having sisters and brothers in the same Dawra Sharia and studying together? This type of studying will create uh, competition and create uh, achievements between ourselves. How can you be studying tafsir and hadith and sitting side by side by women who are strange to you? It doesn't make sense to me. Ask any individual who studied from a classical source or from the Jami'at, what do you find? You never have such things. But what type of preachers do we find at the moment? Boy, live on stage, laughing, joking, clapping, shouting, screaming. And those same individuals, تَخَرَّجُوا مِنْ جَامِعَاتِ الْعَلَّانَ وَفُلَانَ come out of great big uh, institutes of learning. I wonder what their mashayikh would say about them. Because I know what my sheikh would say to me, is this what you learn from us? It's not just academia. It's not just academia that you learn from the mashaykh. It's everything you learn from them. The way they conduct. Because everything that they learn is taken from the nusus, from the text. Emulation of the Prophet Muhammad We don't need fiqh al-jadid. I don't understand. Fiqh al-jadid in teaching people Islam. The new concept of teaching Islam to people. Centuries have gone by people learning Islam. People still become Muslims. So what type of new deen are you trying to present to the people? That this will encourage people to come into the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but create nothing but facade. Even the non-Muslims have concluded that the free mixing of individuals creates corruption. Boys will excel in all boys' school. Girls will excel in all girls' schools. The results are clear, visible. Go and look at any state school. Look at the entrances. Some 50, 60 years ago. Boys, girls. But we want to 
turn everything upside down. We want to now bring it into the Sharia that there should be this type of understanding in studying the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That we should have this. There should be clear principles that we follow. These circles and these agendas that you find of people sitting there, of laughing, joking. That's what we become. And from in had al hadith ta'jabun, wa antum tadhakuna wa la tabkun, wa antum samidun, fastudu lillahi wa abudu. That's what we do. We marvel at the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We marvel at it. We marvel at a hadith. You don't weep. You don't cry. You just laugh about it. Wa antum samidun. And read amongst the classical works of ulama tafasir. What's the meaning of wa antum samidun? In merriment, enjoyment, clapping, whistling, entertaining yourselves. That's the state of the Muslim Ummah. We're just a bunch of entertainers. Full stop. That's what we are. We're entertainers. People will flock to listen to entertainers. Boy, the Sheikh's an entertainer. Let's listen to him. He makes me laugh. He rejoices me. Yeah, time there is. Yeah, yeah alhamdulillah. Sa'atan wa sa'atan. The time is there. But look what's happening at the moment. We don't have time to joke around anymore. Tell me we've got time to joke around. It's clearly visible what the state of the Muslim Ummah is at the moment. In every single aspect. It's going down and down, further and further, down and down. And if we don't begin to wake up and revive those true principles, then it will only be a matter of time that all of us will sink down. That's what will happen. All of us will, are in that same Safina, living this land. We're all in that same ship. That those people trying to dig the hole underneath to get the water themselves and trying to ignore us on the top, possibly we hope to be on the people on the top, inshallah. They're going to drown and we're going to drown. So we have to remove these evil practices and these sicknesses that we find. And then unfortunately comes the final stage. The stage of which by the limbs will testify to that quest, to that desire of committing a zina. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect all of us and our shabab from that. And as you find in the hadith, look at the words of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa that the zina of the eyes is the glance. The zina of the speech is this, of the tongue is the speech. The zin of the hands is the touching. The zin of the legs is the walking. And then the private parts testify if that was the actual inclination of the individual by doing the major action. Look at the prophecy. Look at the statements. The type of words that the Prophet Muhammad used to highlight to us. And this is as Ibn, Ibn Qayyim al-Jawziyah highlights, the famous student of Shaykh Hussam ibn Taymiyyah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mercy be upon both of them that this is a sin that destroys you both in this dunya and in the akhirah. And it's become evident what is the destruction of the individual in this dunya. <coughs> it's the spreading of the disease of AIDS which has no cure. As prophesied by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu that when people begin to fornicate like animals behave in that manner a disease will come and there will be no cure for that disease. Many ulama have gone to the view that that refers to AIDS. What does the Quran highlight? Right, talking about the major al-kabair, major sins. In the pattern of major sins you find, teaching the Muslim ummah, Don't come to any form of fawahish what is apparent or what is hidden. Ponder over those of you who are the linguistics studying the Arabic language what does it mean wala taqrabu as we'll come to doesn't highlight Quran doesn't say wala taf'alu don't do it and as I began with that Islam is blocking you from going into sins a principle wal inna ma harama rabbi al fawahisha ma dhahara minha wa ma batan again in the Quran say my lord has made it haram upon me every type of fawahish illicit sexual misconduct and behavior that leads to that or after that whatever is apparent or hidden and then comes the most clearest ayah that you find wala taqrabu zina innahu kana fahishatan wa sa'a sabila wala taqrabu bi ma'na wala taf'alu or rather Allah subhanahu wa didn't say wala taf'alu don't do it he said wala taqrabu don't even go near zina and so that begins as we mentioned by the glance the speech Conversations, intimacy, relationship, and then you find this final evil action that you find that the person should stay away from at all any expense. 
And thus you find that this leads to what? Amongst you know, the signs of their judgment that sexual misconduct will become promiscuity, will become common, lewdness will become common in society. What are the dangers in this dunya? What do you find as Ibn Qayyim highlights? Which are evident today as I mentioned disease, STD, aborted children, broken down families, destruction of one's family, lineage, disorder, warfare, honor killing, all of that stems. Those five principles that we talk about, you've destroyed them. And then you find it will come a people from our own ummah who will make it yastahillun al-hira wal harir will make this action to be lawful and make the wearing of silk and ma'azif and musical instrument etc. to be halal. It's something to be wary of. And then the sad thing is that, ya yeah, ikhwan, the saddest thing is that some individuals boast about their actions. That's the sad thing. We should think about that carefully. If any person is indulged in haram actions, you should give them advice. If they indulge inside the action, make, they should be made to make, made to you know, feel you know, guilty about themselves. They should not be going around expressing themselves. Unfortunately, is what we find. Because once you lose that shame, then you've lost your iman. And as I mentioned, that modesty is a part of Iman, that any wrong action that you do should burn away inside your heart. Should burn away inside your heart. And this is something, a disobedient action towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as I mentioned, if you study the end and how the Quran highlights that the adulterous woman and adulterous man, that you should yani, flog them, a hundred flogs and exile them. Any for a year which comes any inside the hadith, but a hundred flogs comes inside the Quran. As for the individuals you find who are married, or these people who do this, a stone to death for married individuals, and what do you find a day of judgment? In a state of nudity in ovens, and they'll be burnt from underneath. In a state of nudity exposed in front of everyone. So we should begin to think about what could be the final end of the individual, what could happen to them inside this dunya, and also Obviously, before that, think about when you return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of carrying out this major sin. And thus, we should begin to understand about our children, about our environment, how to preserve our society, how to preserve the people around us, and to teach them the concept of chastity, of lowering the gaze, lowering the speech, etc., and to stay away of anything that could lead to vice and sin. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala place in these words in a mizan of hasanat give us all the tawfiq and ability to stay away from al-fawahish ma ubahara minha wa ma batan any types of illicit behavior whatever is in the open or hidden and make us return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a pure and a sound heart and good actions to present in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala barakallahu feekum wa akhulu qawli hada wa astaghfir lali wa lakum wa lajameel muslimin fa astaghfir wa inna wa lagafur rahim subhanakallahu wa bihamdika shura la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik barakallahu feekum